Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. As he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Paul. What a fun show we have for our listeners today. My guest, world adventurer Alex Yost, takes us from living the high life in Medellin, Colombia, of all places, to exploring new species of life in the Galapagos Islands, and then how he founded a business for transporting priceless artifacts for the richest of the rich. And in the midst of all of this, Alex reveals that how through these adventures, he has attained a peaceful inner life filled with deep spirituality. So, let's join the conversation as we take a look at The World According to Alex Yost. Alex Yost, Adventure Extraordinaire. Welcome to the next chapter with Charlie. Charlie, what a pleasure. Always great to talk to you, my friend. Yeah, it is. You know, Alex, I was thinking about it, and we met five or six years ago when your nephew, Ryan Buchter, and my son were playing baseball together for the San Diego Padres. Now, neither one plays for the Padres. Uh, And uh, where is Ryan now? Ryan is with the uh, Arizona Diamondbacks in spring training right now. Austin's with Cleveland, and he played San Diego today. Oh, that's in, funny. In yeah. spring training. Yeah, he had a great game. That was good fun. Now, good. at the time we met, you know, I thought you were a real estate guy and because you were doing real estate in the Phoenix area. And uh, even back then, my wife and I were thinking of moving to the Phoenix area, Scottsdale area, and we're still considering it now. But you were in real estate, but that wasn't for a long time, was that? Well, Charlie, I, I, I had my real estate license for quite a while, actually, because I had some properties that I wanted to sell myself. So for me, it made sense to pay $400 and, and not have all those commissions when I'm selling properties, right? So, well, it, this morphed into a career because um, I had just been around the Phoenix area, Scottsdale area, and I, I just knew the lay of the land. I had great contacts and just sort of naturally was a, a good uh, a good place for me to be at that point in time. But, um, yeah, shortly after, I, I, I sold everything in Phoenix, uh, in Scottsdale, and I, I, um, I traveled, and, um, and I've been traveling, and, and I've done that. I, I started the traveling bug back uh, in the mid-2000s, but really since 2017, I've lived out of the country longer than I've lived in the country. Uh, with the exception of last year, of course, because of the world events, as we all know. Yeah. And I... uh, some family issues. But other than that, um, yeah, it's been a been a pretty nice um, experience uh, that I've had. You know, in, with different cultures. I don't. I don't. I don't do your typical traveling, now, Charlie. I don't. I don't go say to Thailand and and. Uh, spend time at all the tourist spots. I go and I immerse myself in the culture, pick up the, the social cues, uh, meet people from all over the world, stay for three months at a time, three and a half months at a time, stay in an Airbnb, really have a full experience. I'm trying to get the most out of it, squeeze the most I can out of that experience. I find that vacation traveling leaves you a little empty. I mean, I, if I want to go to the beach, you know, I can go to the beach pretty much anywhere in the world and have the same experience of drinking margaritas on the beach and, you know, that kind of thing and staying at a hotel. You know, I want to be able to actually get under the fingernails of the people that that live there, you know, and and find out what makes them tick and really immerse myself. I ended up going to South America knowing probably a handful of words in Spanish, which was interesting. And well, well, excuse me, but look at the countries. Down there. Look at the countries yeah. you went to. I mean, I, I have Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Colombia, Ecuador, uh, the Galapagos Islands, and then, like you said, Thailand. And you know, that's that's quite a wide array of countries to experience. Every country had its own nuance, had its own uh, amazing qualities. Obviously, the Galapagos is known for adventure travel. Um, and I was fortunate enough to start a business there 
where we, I could put tour packages together for North Americans so they could experience sort of the same things that I was. Um, in Colombia, I lived in Medellin, Colombia, and I lived in the mountains outside. Now, we talked there about Medellin. The, uh, Medellin, there was a time that was the cartel <laughs> capital of the world, was it not? Yeah, it, it was. Those days, they, um, the Colombians are, are not proud of that time whatsoever. And they really, uh, you know, Netflix has really done a job on the Colombian um, tourist industry, especially in Medellin. Yeah, but, was that um, Pablo Escobar? Is that Was that Medellin? That, that's correct. Hollywood, I, you know, with the movies and things like yeah, that. Yeah, I now, kept up. That I kept up with the movies. Yeah, well, well, prior to that, there were fifty years of war there as well. So, you know, it was it was a very turbulent place. What is it like now? Medellin was the one of the most beautiful cities that I ever lived in, and I, I say that I, I lived in a place called Laureles, and I lived in a place called El Poblado which was the outdoor malls in these places are comparable to if you've ever been to the Scottsdale Fashion Square Mall. This is not a third world whatsoever. The movie theaters there have reclining uh, seats and waiters, just as you would have, you know, in any modern city here, you know, upscale. The people, the Paisa people are some of the most friendly, outgoing, kind, courteous people you'll ever meet in your life. Now, are there some shady sections? Of course. But I would say that I would much rather, if I had to walk five blocks, say, in New York City right now, or walk five blocks in Medellin, I would pick the latter for sure. No kidding. Now, uh, now didn't you compare, didn't you compare Colombia with, you said, the cities you were in were somewhat similar, although not coastal, but were somewhat similar similar to Montecito, which is the you know really well-to-do area outside of Santa Barbara. Yes, and there are very very well-to-do areas there. You know, the, there is a burgeoning middle class in Colombia. However, you still have extremely wealthy people, and you do have extremely poor people. However. The, the the flora and fauna in some of these areas where where I was was just unbelievably beautiful. There are four different ecosystems in Colombia. Also, you have an Amazon area, you have a mountain area, a uh, high desert plain kind of area, you have a beach area. So, literally, Bogota. The weather in Bogota is similar to San Francisco. It's cooler. Then you go down into places like Guatapé. Uh, you go into the coffee regions, a place called Armenia, and you have these beautiful mountain hillsides, green and lush, that remind me uh, of California. I mean, just with no humidity, temperatures ranging from, say, the lows of 55 up to 85. Oh, my. So it, it's just, it's unbelievably beautiful. And um, what was really attractive for me is the fact that, you know, listen, I'm not a millionaire. I like to travel. The exchange rate <laughs> is a four-time multiple there. Oh so my. you'll see a lot of expats living on $50,000 a year pensions and able to live very well in Colombia and have a great quality of life. Tell me about the people. Um, what, are the, what, what, you know, now you, you've got an also, as you said, you've got three classes, but of you know your everyday people are they the the poor class or are they the the middle class depending on where you live now the areas where i lived it was uh, upper middle class the education system there uh, what i noticed is not like we have in the us in the fact that uh right after high school the career path was going directly into your field so there wasn't necessarily a uh a system of four years where you get a bachelor's degree and then go to graduate school. It would be high school and then going in to become an engineer or sort to become of like a, a, a high-level trade school. Correct. That's exactly a way, good way to put it. So what what I would see would be people with multiple degrees, highly intelligent people, from really really nice families that were working really really hard and living 
by our standards, would be a very middle class existence. So it, it was really interesting to see the level of education versus what people were actually making there. Were in they the were they friendly? Did they were they friendly to the United States people, or is it one of those kind of anti United States countries? No, they they love us, Charlie. We you know they they see us as the catalyst for getting rid of Pablo Escobar, especially in Medellin. Where I lived was a place near the stadium, Estadio. And there are two soccer teams, Nacional and Medellin. And they would play a few times, three times a year. And, and I was in, fortunate enough to have a penthouse that overlooked the stadium. I could actually look into the stadium. And, <laughs> and, so, you, and you're not would, wealthy and you have a penthouse overlooking the stadium? Well, if I told you what I paid, you would... You would be you would be very very surprised. <laughs> that's that's the the exchange rate uh, leverage we're talking about. Yeah, so, uh, it's pretty cool. But I couldn't walk down the street, Charlie, without somebody saying "Gringo Benaki," and all of a sudden I'd come over, and uh, there would be a shot of um, they call it aguardente or guaro. It's a, kind of a liqueur, kind of like sambuca. I could be in my gym clothes, walking my dog. And, uh, yeah, I would go over, and I couldn't escape, you know, someone coming over and trying to talk to me. Outdoor cafes, the weather, again, being so perfect. And there's patio restaurants everywhere, cafes. Well, you've uh, just very put, social atmosphere. You've just put Colombia and Medellin on my list of places that I want to spend some time in. <laughs> you know what I'm curious about, what I really would love to talk a bit about, because I think a lot of us here in the U.S. are really curious about the Galapagos Island. You know, it is the islands. You know, they're so strange, so 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 mysterious. And and to us, I don't know how true this is, but they seem to be sort of the epicenter of evolutionary development. And so lots of keen science is going on there as well. Tell, tell me about what was your experience like on the Galapagos Islands? Well, to your point, Charlie, there's new species of marine animals found every day there. 360 plus marine animals, new species found there a year. No way. Pretty amazing. Are they, are they, the are, are they, are they marine yeah. or are they on land? No, this, this is the underwater stuff. This is, this okay. is, th these are the new, um, seahorses or the new variety of, of sea cucumber or wh whatever there is. It is absolutely and amazing. What you have is a confluence of the currents there, cold currents from South America, and then the warm currents around the equator. And these are volcanic islands. Uh, and it is absolutely incredible when I can't even describe to you when, when you when you see an iguana that actually swims underwater and is eating algae and then comes up and then lays and suns itself. When you go and you snorkel with sea lions that maybe have never seen a human being in their life, and they're coming up, and they're more inquisitive than a human being is when you're snorkeling with these things. They'll come right up to you and say, what the heck is this thing in front of me? It, you can't even describe uh, the, the, um, the experience. It's very rustic. You're not going to have the four seasons there, so you need to be ready for that, you know, obviously, but... I say, what a bummer, no snow. <laughs> no snow, no snow whatsoever. You know, the season there, too, there really isn't a down season. So for tourism, it's it's really nice. I mean, I think August may be a really awesome time to go. Now, with COVID, they've downsized their fleets as far as um, the tours go that, that are uh, the, the ships. Okay, so... If, you're, if you plan on taking some sort of cruise there or one of these semi-private cruises where there's 14, 15 people on uh, the ships, usually that's not a good way to go. Now, the real nice thing that we had is, you know, my connections actually owned an eco-lodge on um, Santa Cruz Island. And so what we were able to do is fly people into Baltra Island, which is right next to Santa Cruz, stay at our uh, eco-lodge, and then do day trips. So a two-and-a-half-hour boat ride on a 42-foot boat, which is kind of like, a, I'd say, a fishing boat with benches on it almost. Yeah, that's you a good-sized boat. You, a 42-foot <laughs> boat is a good-sized boat. Yeah. yeah. 
and uh, you, you get out to the different islands. Um, Santa Fe Island is where I saw the sea lions. You know, that's where I had my interactions there. What I really like about the islands uh, is that everything runs like clockwork. The uh, Ecuadorian Navy is involved in everything. We actually, I had I had a one. I had a sort of a an event that could have turned into something really, really bad. Our, our boat was taking on water. Our small boat. And we were in the middle, maybe an hour, hour and a half out in the middle of the ocean. There. Oh my. Yeah, there were about thirty-five of us on the boat. Thirty of us on the boat. Any panic? Yeah, it got people? a little sketchy, but. Well, we had to be rescued, and, and you know, we lucked out. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> we, we ended up being rescued by a, um, a cruise ship that was, <laughs> we we'll put it this way, when we got on the ship, we were offered hors d'oeuvres and, uh, you know, champagne. So <laughs> it, it wasn't a bad spot to land, let's put it that way. So, um, a, travel up, a travel upgrade. Yeah, yeah, that was a travel upgrade for sure. But these are these are the fun things, and the, this is what makes the experiences so rich. And especially going to these places, you know, none of these cookie cutter vacations where everything flows really well. Heck, sometimes in South America, the flights just don't run, the trains don't run on time everywhere, obviously. And you know, you just got to roll with the punches, and you can't get worked up about it. You just got to go with it, and. Um, you know, you've been to Hawaii. Everything's on Hawaiian time in Hawaii. That's kind of the way it is, you know, in, in South America in many regards. You just have to kind of just uh, go with the culture and and, uh, and fit in and enjoy the ride. And that's what it's all about. You know, we're planning a trip that's sort of in between that in this September, and we're going to uh, a little bit of time in Portugal, but then we're going to spend some time in Spain and some time in Italy and and I want to uh, go and be able to pray with the saints. So we're spending some time in Avila to to visit Saint Teresa of Avila's convents, and and while my wife shops, I'll be mm-hmm. at the convents and the monasteries, and then go to um, Umbria in Italy, where Assisi is, and Saint Francis of Assisi. And so it's sort of a Sort of a combination. It has it has the nice shopping and the nice play things that my life wants. My wife wants to go to, but it's not that she's not interested in spiritual a- adventures. But but that's where I'm not I'm not interested in shopping. But it is sort of you know we have a week in a, a Sizi and it's really unplanned. We're we're going to pick a, a place to stay and then choose our days as they go along. And I yeah. I, I like traveling that way rather than. You know that old movie. It's Tuesday, so it must be, so it must be Paris. You know the the, the strict, <laughs> the strict tourist schedule. I, I don't do well with those. Yeah, and I take it a step further because I usually travel alone. I, I don't I don't like traveling with others only because I think that limits the experience for me as well. Yeah, I, I too, and, uh, I've done some travel alone, and I like I love traveling with my wife. My wife is I can't imagine a better travel companion. You, you know, you know, she gives me grace to be sort of that that introvert to go off by myself and do things alone. But when I do travel alone, and it's not that frequent, but I went to um, I went to see the Northern Lights and spent time in northern in Northern Europe, in Sweden and Norway. And I was by myself, and I just loved that because it was totally free. I had, I had nothing planned. Mm. What is it that drives you to be such what I'm calling an inquisitive gypsy? What is it that makes you want to live the gypsy life? Personality traits are openness, and I am an extrovert. So those things, and, and that's, that's just in my DNA. Charlie, I just, I can't not be that person that I realized that, you know, after college, I moved to Arizona from the East coast with $500 in my pocket. And I knew one person in Arizona. So, you know, I've always had that sort of thing. And even in college, I mentioned, um, I think we talked about this before in another conversation we had, but you and I have something in common, although probably decades apart, is the fact that hey, I, I traveled. I watched I, I watched a lot of Grateful Dead shows in the early '90s. 
you know, when I was going to school. I, I would see these people and how free, and I saw what really liberating uh, liberalism was about, you know, being being just, uh, you know, being able to live and sell veggie burritos, you know, and travel and, and live your lifestyle the way you want it to. And there's something that just drew me to that. Um, and uh, I didn't come from that sort of background whatsoever. I had a very, very traditional upbringing. East Coast, um, you know, private school, you know, whole nine yards, uh, college athlete, four-year degree in business. And, you know, I was all set to have the corner office with the nameplate eventually. And that just wasn't in the cards for me. I ended up starting a moving company in Arizona. Yeah, you gotta tell us about the mo- you've gotta tell us about the moving company. You know, moving well, main <laughs> dynasty vases. I mean this is I you know, I still can't get over that. Well, Charlie, this business started as a summer job in my in my early twenties. Uh, just delivering leather sofas in Scottsdale because my friend had a box truck and he needed the payments made. Well, gosh, I was making more money in a week than I was making in my office job and having a lot more fun. And long story short is over four years, this business developed into working primarily with interior designers in Paradise Valley and Scottsdale and a warehouse and teams of men that would travel all over the West Coast and all over the country, and eventually different parts of the world, to move furniture for, let's just say, the 0.1% of the 0.1% wealthiest people in the U.S. We'll just put it that way. Think of the people that you associated with and how how fun yeah. and unique that is to learn what that's all about and to see. And then you get to have a personal experience with fine art, which, you know, that by itself makes me jealous. Well, the interesting, we were, we were you know, the specialty handling industry. That That's really what we did. And we specialized in uh, not only artwork, but, um, you know, uh, any sort of antique uh, whether it was a vase from the Ming Dynasty, for example, we we could we could handle all these sort of things. I mean, goodness, I, I had over a million dollars just in bolts of fabric stored in my warehouse for my clients. These are the type <laughs> of people we're talking about. It, it was really eye opening. I mean, seeing that sort of wealth. You know, I was the curator for uh, one family's furniture, over five thousand pieces of furniture. Uh, you oh know, they goodness. had to redevelop the, a system of operations for accounting for everything. This these, this one family uh, had over 16 houses, um, San Francisco, Montecito, Puerto Rico, you, you name it. Uh, they had a, a $70 million ship that would, they would dock in Galveston sometimes, sometimes in Miami. And, uh, yeah, we were able to... Um, you know, handle everything professionally. Now, here's the funny thing. It's, I consider it being like an offensive lineman in football. You had to do your job correctly 100% of the time, and you got really, really not a lot of credit for it. The one time that you screwed up, the camera's on you, and all of a sudden you're pulled out of the ball game because, you know, the touchdown's pulled back because you had a whole holding call against you or I something like know. that. Okay. Yeah, that that's, the stress of that has to be just enormous. It was, and, you know, to be perfectly frank, um, at that point in my life, I was, I didn't learn how to let go, and I was a control freak. And you can see why. You know, the guys we hired were, you know, not your typical moving people, you know, that looked like they just got out of the penitentiary, per se. Uh, you know, we were hiring clean-cut guys that, that I would train personally. You know, I had a whole protocol for how to act in people's homes. Look, we're not friends with these people, I would tell my guys. You know, we were pretty much butlers in in homes where we would go. So, you know, the interior designer says one one inch to the left, one inch to the right with a sofa. That's great. Yes, ma'am. And, um, you know, we're out of there, you know, and uh, we charged by the hour. We made it, I made a very good living doing that. Um, we charged, you know, for storage we were able to crate and ship furniture all over the world. Um, but it got, you know, it depends how you quantify success coming from, you know, a guy that had really nothing, almost living out of his car, to, you know, being able to accumulate, you know, something and, and, and being very proud of that, but still feeling empty. Yeah, it and, feels like And it, not it feeling feels like, like a... I, I really had, 
you know, this material success, and, and granted, we're talking, you know, again, I'm not talking, um, you know, millions and billions of dollars like my clients had, but experiencing a success from zero to, to that, uh, you'd think that I would have some sort of ability to sit back and smell the roses, but no, I, I, I couldn't do that, Charlie. There's no way. I, I started getting into um, Muay Thai and mixed martial arts and physical training uh, to where I'm, you know, extreme hiking, all kinds of different things to kind of push myself and still feeling empty, you know. And so I realized that it's a spiritual thing for me. And, you know, yeah, the spiritual to, battle that life is. Talk to me about is, that. Talk to me know. about that spiritual battle. Yeah, well, my thing was um, I had to learn to let go, but not just of just control over my business, but I had to kill my ego and to live without judgment and attachments. And uh, the way I did that was, was really interesting in the fact that I discovered that my thoughts and were all lies, whether they're good or they're bad, and they come from a deception, a point of deception or a deceiver, no matter how you categorize that, you know, but some point where, you know, you need to watch your thoughts and kind of like watching a television show, being able to observe your thoughts and understand that, you know, those thoughts are, are false. They're lies. And once you can do that, you can control your emotions, you can control your feelings, insecurities, all these different things that people take, uh, you know, drugs for and go to therapy for, these, are, this, these things all can be controlled. And, and this, this is what I've done. I've been able to do that through meditation and primarily through a connection that I found with God. You and I, I told you, you before, I, you, you, I'm you, Bible you, know, you know what I want to do? Not. I, I know you're not. And, and I want to talk about that spiritual connection. And that's sort of a transition period. What I'd like to do is take a break right now. And it won't be long, and we will be right back to continue on with the spiritual transformation. Hi, you're listening to The Next Chapter with Charlie, with Charlie Hedges, and my very special guest, the, as I called him, the adventurer extraordinaire, Alex Yost, who has had lived in several countries, had several different jobs, is never stuck in one place. And and now he's alluding to the idea that there is a deeply, a deeply spiritual connection to his wandering and to his learning. And, and I want you to continue on with with the spiritual disciplines the idea of good and evil, right and wrong, and what your spiritual connection is all about, Alex. Would you tell us more about that? I, I certainly can. Yeah. The um, what it boils down, Charlie, for me is with all the with all the traveling and and the different things that I've done, the experiences I've had as an entrepreneur, still feeling empty. What I learned was that by looking within. I found the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is within. And the material world, you listen, I'm able to overcome anger and resentment, and the material world will just put me back into these realms of, of worry and anxiety and things of like that. So when I can detach from that, I am able to become a beacon of goodness, I would say. And I'm able to understand that the, the light of God works through me. I'm just a human vessel, and I think that uh, we're just spirits in this world, uh, going, you know, experiencing a life, but we are spiritual beings. We're, we're, we're muscle and bone, all that kind of stuff, obviously. For me, it became very, very real. I forgave my mother forgave my father, not that they were evil people, but for me, that I, I, I found the, um, the problem that I was having in my life was that I was, had this anger inside and this resentment. My mother turned me away from my father, 
and my father didn't protect me from my mother. And when, when I was able to, to forgive and to truly understand that they're just human beings, just what it boils down to is, um, you know, I think we've talked about this previously, is uh, just, you know, Socrates mentioned to know thyself is the beginning of wisdom. And when you can really unpeel the layers and, and see what's going on and within yourself, and the only way to do that is to really be honest and to live in the truth. Um, and the way I came through that is to understand that observing your thoughts and understanding that where stress comes from and where all these ideas come that uh, lead to negativity in your life takes you away from and taking these items that take you away from God, take you away from channeling God's love and wisdom in your life, really can set us free. Just that understanding can really set us free from things that stop us in life, from moving forward, free us from emotional worries, stresses, anxieties. And everything I realized came from resentment and anger. Really? Now... My heart is not filled with any of these things. It, I equate sin and falling short. Everything stems from resentment and anger. Yeah, I can I can identify with that. You know, I think it's I think everybody's core. Each each of us have a different core that takes care. I take it for me. It's not so much resentment, but it is it is abuse and neglect and then i didn't so much resent that but i just felt the pains of it and the difficulties of it and i had to look at that through different eyes you know what's really amazing me is what you're talking about the spirituality you're talking about is exactly i mean it's it's very very close to what's known as uh, christian mysticism and the mystics all talk about uh, abandoning the ego they call it abolishing the ego, getting rid of the small self, the the egocentric, selfish, I need to take care of myself, small self, in order to give room for the larger self and the larger entity we call God to take that space. And those are the kinds of things that you're talking about. And I love the Socrates quote. I, I, I you know, to know thyself is a beginning of wisdom. Uh, St. Teresa of Avila writes about that a lot. She talks, she talks much of her writing is talking about self-knowledge and through her seven mansions of prayer that each mansion you are going deeper and deeper into self-knowledge and as she and St. John of the Cross will both write about abolishing or annihilating the ego. So this is, these are, these are not just these are biblical truths. These are world truths. I think these are life truths. No matter what theological perspective from which you approach them, they are life truths because other religions focus on them as well. Yeah, I mean, even Eckhart Tolle talks about living in the now and the present. Yes. And, you know, when, when you meditate on in, in God's Word and, and you, you, you're able to be still and know... You're able to live in the now. There is no past. There is no future. There is just this very moment. And that's when you connect with God, in my opinion. That's when I do. That's when I find my connection in my mind's eye. You know, a spiritual teacher, if, if I may, a spiritual teacher loves to take the mantra that takes him into, that takes him into meditation is he repeats, he repeats this mantra be still and know that I am God. Be still and know. Be still. Be. You know, you just take each one of those in, in successive steps, and, and those mantras take him into a, to a place, into a meditative space. And, and, and that's exactly, you know, I have my tools to do that, um, that I've sort of developed, and, and just through teachers that I've run across, and yeah, that's exactly what I do every morning and every night. And when I do that, it seems like my world comes together. I don't, I don't have aspirations, Charlie, to really do anything except be. 
And what I found is that things come my way now. I, I don't force them. I don't worry about things. And I'm meeting amazing people. I'm interacting with not only just successful people, but really people that I can, people of character that I can, that I can really learn from in a lot of ways. Um, I have job opportunities coming my way now. I have, you know, I'm living in Tampa, Florida now, exploring a new existence here and just really excited to wake up every day, kind of like a kid on Christmas, waking up ready to seize the day. I have and never heard anybody from I've never heard anybody from Tampa, Florida saying I wake up in the morning thinking about seizing the day. <laughs> that is that <laughs> that shows that it's shows you a little way back here. As I've listened to to what you said today and our previous conversations, you seem to live a fearless life in that you have the ability to change quickly while also knowing when it is time to stay put for a while. There's a time for change and a time for staying put. How do you know the difference? How do you know when it's time to move on and when it's time to stay put? Is, is it all intuition, or is, do, are there any criteria that you use? That is very intuitive, uh, intuitive nature that I've developed, Charlie. And, and the reason why is because I find that my feet are firmly planted in the sand. And I, I, the winds of life and the tr- trials and tribulations of life can try to bend me one way or the other. And I kind of know when it's time to, to pick up it and move on and where there's maybe another opportunity And I've been able to sift through that information, uh, again, just by being really just knowing myself again and understanding that I am an extrovert. I'm able to flip the table up uh, and, and disrupt my entire life and then recreate my life out of that chaos. And I have the confidence to do that. And And you have the need to create chaos too. I mean, I, I function really well in chaos. I don't try to create it necessarily, although I will, but I am my best self in create in chaos. That is when the the truest me and the best me comes out because I am I'm removed from any choice in the matter. I just have to make a decision and move on. I heard somebody once say and I'm not not sure who they were quoting, but I love this quote. It says Prayer is when we communicate to God. Intuition is when God communicates to us. Mm. Yeah. I like that. that. That's a wonderful way to put that. Isn't that, isn't I, that a, I love that. Yeah. Love. Yeah. Because we can't, we, you know, God doesn't deal in text messages and emails. You know, it is, it is an intuition. It is sort of a, I don't want to call it a feeling, but there is a, there's something going on inside that is a message inside. And unfortunately, because of our American ideals and, and, and the standards that we live by, we sometimes are fearful of living out that intuition because it could threaten our safety. And that is one thing that really we cling to is being safe. And so, so it's like it's like someone being in an abusive relationship, and and I, I often say that someone will stay in an abusive relationship because a bad known is better than any unknown. I, I'm so mm-hmm. fearful of the unknown, right. but at least I can predict the bad known. And what you what the life you live by is a bad known. It's time to make a move. That's it. And I consider myself a rugged individualist to the point where. Historically, I look back, my goodness, our ancestors came here on, and overcame so many odds. You look at it, the life ex- lifespan at 19, the year 1900 was 46 years for, for a man. I mean, we've almost doubled that now. So Amazing. you're right. Maybe there is a little bit of softness. Maybe there's a little bit of, um, you know, um, anxiety for change, you know, because we have this soft existence and, I think that is an issue also is, is, in my opinion, is manhood and what, does, what defines a man now and uh, what level of 
of of tolerance for enduring do do men have now in society? And oh, that's, that's a, a very very important thing to know how to do is to be able to go through the struggle and and not complain about it and just wake up every day and chip away and chip away and work hard and and try to get to the next level. And you know, good things happen for people who take chances. And, and I'm a firm believer in that. And so I'm not afraid to do that, Charlie. And, and you know what? If I, if, I, if I do stumble and I do have a setback in some capacity, I consider it a learning experience. And, um, again, it, you, know, you understand where I'm coming from with the realizations that I've had through, through the traveling and things like that. But when you lose the ego, then you're not worried about what other people think. You're not worried about... You know, who's going to judge you for this or for that? You just pick up the pieces and you go. And um, it's it's not a hard concept. It, the journey is 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 really not that difficult if we can get over ourselves, in my opinion. I I, I love that. You 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 know what I what because I, I I so I so agree with so many things that you had to say there in that in that last bit. And here's the way I want to close our podcast. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a question that I've never asked anyone on the podcast before. And you may have just answered it, except I'm, I'm looking for sort of a, a succinct, you know, Tim Ferriss's, um, what do you call them? Not bulletin boards, but you call, what are, you, what are on the freeways? Billboards, yeah, billboards. He said, yeah, what was yeah. your billboard statement? And So I'm not looking for a billboard statement, but here's my question uh, that, that I, I really want to know from you. If you had one personal truth that you feel everyone should know or practice, one personal truth that you feel everyone should know or practice, what would that be? You know, Charlie, it's always very difficult for me to <laughs> to be a, 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 a person that can describe things in less than two sentences, but I'll do my best. I think that God speaks of the truth and the truth sets us free. I get it. I love it. Alex Yost, what a charming treat. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending time with me today. It's been an honor. The honor is all mine, Charlie. I I really enjoyed our conversation, and and, and thanks so much. Thank you. And I also want to thank our listeners for tuning in to the next chapter with Charlie, and please be sure to check us out at the website, uh, thenextchapter.life, L-I-F-E. And until next... This is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now.